Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live webcast about Fukushima and radiation in the ocean. We are broadcasting today from the Ocean Science Center at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. As you watch our presentation, you may send your questions to us via Twitter using at Aquarium Pacific and the hashtag AOP Fukushima. Or you can send us an email to live at lbaop.org. I'm Jerry Schubel, the president of the aquarium, and I'm delighted that you all are all here. In March 2011, one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded shook Japan for nearly six minutes, creating a devastating tsunami that engulfed more than 200 miles of Japan's coastline and damaged the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Before we begin our discussion, I want to recognize and remember the 16,000 people who lost their lives or went missing during the earthquake and the tsunami. This was a great tragedy for the people of Japan and for the rest of the world, and recovery con is ongoing. It is our hope that through research, we can build better tsunami warning systems, improve the safety of our methods of generating energy, and protect our environment in the event of a disaster. I want to remind everyone that today is the fourth anniversary of the earthquake and the tsunami that led to the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster, which resulted in the largest accidental release of radioactivity into the ocean in history. In this webcast, we will address radiation sources to the ocean and how these levels were affected after Fukushima. People are also concerned about radiation and the safety of seafood from Japan, or seafood fi fish that originated in Japan and swam across to the west coast of the United States. And they're interested in whether radiation has reached the west coast, and we're going to discuss all of that. Now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker. We are proud to have a relationship with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. These two organizations have worked to produce this new show, Fukushima and our Radioactive Ocean, which is going to debut in just a few minutes. Dr. Ken Busler was one of the key collaborators. In fact, he was the key collaborator. He's a senior scientist of marine chemistry and geochemistry at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and he specializes in the study of natural and man-made radionuclides in the ocean. He organized the first international oceanographic expedition to Japan following the Fukushima disaster, and he created our radioactiveocean.org, which publishes reports on radioactivity analyses of samples collected along the West Coast and Hawaii by citizen scientists. Ken, welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you again, Jerry. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here today and to see actually this morning for the first time this project we've been working on, this production for Science on the Sphere about our radioactive oceans and putting this in context of the accidents four years ago at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, I like to tell people this is an unprecedented event for the oceans. And Jerry mentioned accidentally this is the largest release to the oceans. And by that, we can compare it to Chernobyl, for example. 
for some isotopes like cesium, the ones we measure quite readily that have a health concern, uh, they're comparable levels, smaller certainly from Fukushima, but it was on the ocean. So 80 or 90 percent of that radioactivity either fell into the ocean from the atmosphere, was delivered through the waters that were used to cool those reactors or groundwaters, infiltrating to this day, it's still a leaky site, to the ocean. Chernobyl was hundreds of miles from the ocean. So for the ocean, this was a big event. That's why it was so urgent for us to get there in 2011 to see which isotopes were there, what were their levels. The Japanese have done more on this than we certainly have, but we're trying to add to that and bring confirmation of some of the results they were presenting. Well, how bad was it in terms of ocean levels? Uh, we measure radioactivity in becquerels at a K event per second, and the levels went from one or two of those units up to 20 to 50 million right near the reactor, right on the shores of Japan in 2011. Now, thankfully, they went down quite quickly, but I think the thing about radioactivity that's hard to explain often is while there can be risk at any level, there's a big difference between one or two of these units and tens and 20 million. At the tens of millions, you can actually have direct effects on marine biota, reproductive effects, mortality. You really don't want to be in those waters. They decreased quite quickly within about a month when they actually stopped some of the leakage into the ocean. At that point, they got down to, say, a, a 10,000 near Japan, 100,000. That's a point where I can probably be there. We were there measuring three, 4,000 of those units on the research ships we were on at the time. Uh, but you probably don't want to eat the fish because you can internalize things like cesium, get a higher dose, a higher effective on your health. It's a negative effect that we don't want to have, so they've set limits on how much is allowable in seafood products in Japan and in the U.S. and around the world. The levels we're seeing on our coastline, so we're talking 5,000 miles, three to four years later, ocean currents carrying some of that radioactivity. That was a concern about a year ago that led us to start a crowdfunded citizen scientist campaign, Our radio Radioactive Ocean, to collect waters here are down back at that one to two level. And we actually, on along the beaches, can't see any isotopes from Fukushima Daiichi to this date from La Jolla up to Alaska and Hawaii. So while offshore the levels, we can detect two to four more of those units. Uh, we tried to do a dose calculation, something that I'm not actually an expert in. I measure what's in the ocean. I measure what's in the seafloor uh, with colleagues, what's in the seafood. But you get something that's so small, a thousand times less than a single dental x-ray for exposures to levels we're seeing two to three times higher. It might sound like a higher amount, but that's every day swimming in that ocean is going to be thousands of times less than what you might be experiencing in a dental x-ray. It's not a zero risk. It will actually, we think, go up a little bit in the next couple of years because the ocean currents, we're seeing the leading edge of what was released four years ago coming to our coastline. But still, all those distances, you're going to get dilution. You're going to get a decrease in the concentration of these isotopes. And what we've been able to do by empowering citizens to go to their beaches is actually collect that data, which wasn't being done by federal agencies on this scale, uh, partly because what I just told you, the levels are quite, quite low, so not of health concern. But I think the public, when you start talking about radioactivity levels and you can't taste or smell or feel radioactivity, you want to know. So we're trying to give people that information through this Our Radioactive Ocean campaign and hopefully putting this in perspective, Fukushima, with the natural sources we might be exposed to in this video we produced here at the aquarium, with the aquarium. I think that's enough for now. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. The public can learn more about what happened at Fukushima and the Daiichi nuclear power plant uh, with this new show starting today. It will play daily in this Ocean Science Center, and it will play on Na NOAA's, the National Oceanic and Atmospherics uh, Administration Science on a Sphere, which is in Silver Spring, Maryland. And funding for the show was provided by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. <clears throat> So I think now um, we're going to look at this show, or do we want do we want to take some questions first? Have, have you had some, Ali? What have people sent in? Uh, what species of fish are being tested to uh, know what levels of radiation are? 
Where, where's Ken? Right here. Ken, all right. What levels of what species of fish? Uh, in Japan, it's quite extensive. Uh, they measure by location up and down the coastline on their east coast. Uh, all varieties, bottom fish, uh, demersal, that's what they're called, uh, the epipelagic, things like the salmon, tuna, uh, every variety including bottom dwelling fish and things like starfish and whelks and octopus. So seafood testing, uh, I see 10,000 samples a year being tested. On our side, uh, the Canadians and the U.S. through the FDA test fish as well. Uh, scientifically, to see the levels that we're detecting are so small, we actually have to go off into scientific labs. There's a group, SUNY Stony Brook, uh, Nick Fisher and Dan Madigan, that have looked, say, in the bluefin tuna that migrate across, because that's one species that might carry with it some of the isotopes from Japan. And they actually can swim quite fast, two months. And in fact, in that amount of time, they're still losing cesium. About half of the cesium is lost in about two months. Uh, so it's basically all varieties of fish. At the research level, it's the ones that are migrating, like tuna. And for seafood consumption and whether to close or open fisheries, it's everything that might be caught by fishermen and brought to the docks in Japan. Other questions, Ali? Yeah, um, so you mentioned uh, comments about on long-term um, testing, how long, um, where those would be located. Um, so we would so be. And I think we need to repeat the question, right, so people can hear. So, so what about how long will these monitoring programs go on? What's the, the commitment? Well, again, there's two answers. The commitment on our coastline, the west coast of North America, will depend upon governments and citizens to fund this. And right now, a year ago, is the first time I started trying to get funding through crowdsourcing. And we had zero data. Now we have 50 data points. Uh, many of those sites, uh, Scripps Pier, Point Reyes, and a group up in British Columbia now under the name of INFORM have put out funding up to the next two to three years. Uh, in Japan, it will probably continue for decades. We're talking about isotopes with half-lives for radioactive decay of 30 years and more, so they will be continuing to monitor that for decades. Others, Ali? What? What, what have been the impacts of fish near, near the, the nuclear plant and uh, in term fish particularly? Well, the impacts, if you wanted to see an effect directly on the fish, you would have to be at those levels in the first couple of weeks, tens of millions. And that decreased so fast that I don't know of any studies of the impact directly in those first few days. But they remained high enough, and to this day, they've had to keep fisheries closed. So we don't want to internalize or consume them. At those levels, maybe 10,000 times higher, not the tens of millions, uh, it's very difficult to see any effect directly on the marine life. That's a number that's also quite low for our health effects for swimming in those waters. Uh, when we went back last October, the highest number we saw was 100, again, not thousands. But still, for certain types of fish, particularly bottom-dwelling fish, uh, there is a concern for the seafood or consumption of seafood uh, close to those reactor sites in Japan. Any others, Ali? Um, I understand that they're measuring kelp as well. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? Well, tell us about the measurements made of kelp. Yeah, there's a program that kind of came up in parallel to ours given the public concern on the West Coast. And while I look at five gallons of water, so a pretty large amount to get our data, they take kelp samples and look at those as the indicator of cesium concentration in seawater. It's kind of a different thing. I can tell you at that exact point in space and time how much cesium or other isotopes are there. They get some average during the growth cycle of the kelp. Kelp have been used in our field mostly for things like iodine that really concentrate tens of thousands of times higher in kelp. Cesium, not so high of a concentration factor, but still an effective way like a sponge, say, to get at the average levels off the coastline. I'm actually meeting with a scientist this afternoon I've never met, but they're seeing similar results in that they're not detecting uh, the fingerprint of Fukushima. I use that because there's two isotopes of cesium, one 134 cesium that can only come from a more recent source because it decays quite quickly, a two-year half-life versus 137 cesium, a different isotope, 
released in equal amounts from Fukushima that stays around for decades or 30 year half life. So we have a very unique fingerprint. We can tell you exactly where that cesium is from by looking and detecting both isotopes. They have the same ability with the kelp. Okay, last one. The last one, okay. What's the level of public interest on this issue and has the aquarium gotten a lot of concern about it? What's, well, I guess we both ought to answer that then. So what's the level of public interest about this and have, has the aquarium gotten a lot of questions about it and I'll answer the latter if you do the former. Well, the public interest, you know, in this country was very high early on. Uh, there was an atmospheric plume that came across, so people were concerned back in 2011 about the aerosols coming across. And then what I think kind of surprised me, because we were focused on Japan, Japan is still concerned, was concerned, uh, but that people would think that coming four years later, three or four years later, that the levels might still be high enough. And it's a legitimate question. It's just something that we had predicted would not be of concern, but we had no data. So it did surprise me about a year ago when we started our radioactive ocean that the public would be interested enough to actually not only go out and collect the samples but pay to do the analyses. It's very uh, labor intensive, takes several days and hundreds of dollars just to even ship 20 pounds, <laughs> I'm sorry, 50 pounds of water, uh, 20 liters back to Woods Hole. So I would say the interest is still here uh, partly because of our uncertainties, right? There's never zero effect, there's never zero dose but how high will it get? And I think that's something that uh, we should be talking about and putting in context as we try and do in this video here of other sources, where else have we seen it? And these are isotopes, by the way, that were introduced in the 40s and mostly in the 60s from atmospheric nuclear weapons testing. So we've already have cesium in the Pacific Ocean. People don't really appreciate that necessarily. Uh, people like me who study it know that. But the question is how much more have we added and how is it being moved across the ocean? That's still a question people are concerned about. And we certainly have had a lot of interest in if, uh, people who visit the aquarium or to uh, visit our website. People in Southern California and up and down the coast of California are concerned about the possible impacts of radiation from Fukushima. And I think what Ken said is really the key as to why we do things like this. We need to look at these issues and try to put them in context. You can't understand the impacts of Fukushima unless you also understand something about living on a radioactive planet. We do. Every time you take a, a sip of water, every time you take a, a bite of some, some food, you're ingesting radioactivity, most of which comes from rocks in the, in the Earth's crust. And so it, it, part of our mission is to take these complicated, often controversial issues and look at them from different perspectives to try to put them in context. Now, I think <coughs> we are ready now to um, watch the live webcast. And again, this was done in collaboration with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, with Ken, and this is produced entirely in-house by the aquarium's AV team, and one of our people, Keith Miller had the lead in editing it, and he did a wonderful job. So let's, let's roll it, please. <laughs> 